I'm with Sandy Shoshani here at Bayad Hahim, and we're talking about Roe v. Wade. It's just been overturned in the U.S. How did you feel when you heard the news? I was crying for joy. I was absolutely thrilled to see that there are people in the U.S. Supreme Court who have decided that babies are human beings. Mm. And actually, it was an unconstitutional thing to do anyway from the beginning, because the 14th Amendment of the Constitution that was written in 1865 to protect the rights of the people who had been slaves and make them full-righted citizens said that every person, every person has the right to life and liberty. And it was never fair to say that the unborn child, the pre-born child, had no right to life. It's a very historic day, isn't it? It's an amazing day. It's really amazing. Somebody asked me yesterday, have we gone back? Are we now, like, going, you know, losing momentum? And I would say that is absolutely not true, because think of this. In the Holocaust, was it Hitler doing eugenics, trying to clean a race that was progressive? Or was it the people who were fighting him to save the Jewish people? You know, who was progressive? Progressive means that we protect. Was Abraham Lincoln primitive? Or was Abraham Lincoln progressive, saying, let's free and emancipate the slaves? That's progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Franklin Graham says 63 million babies have been aborted. How does that make you feel? Oh, you're just, you're, yeah, your throat goes to your stomach. Mm. It's just appalling that we would kill all those lives. Actually, here in Israel, we are estimating that we have taken the lives of over 2 million babies through abortion. And you know, but the fact is that in the Holocaust, 1.5 million children were killed in the Holocaust. Mm. And now we've killed more than 2 million here. And let's say from 1948, we've killed more than 2 million. That means that we've killed generations. Those children would have been grandparents and great-grandparents. We have killed generations of Israelis. We would have doubled our population had we not aborted all those children. Do you think it could, it could happen here, where the abortion law could be overturned here? If I think, I don't know, if I hope and pray, absolutely. We're actually, we have written a proposal to the Supreme Court of Israel, which we submitted in March of this year, asking to stop abortion at 24 weeks, which is point of viability in Israel. I know in England, babies have been saved at 20 weeks, but here in Israel, they won't try to save a baby unless it's at least 24 weeks. And because abortion here is legal till birth and government funded. And so we wrote that proposal and it was supposed to be answered by May, but then it was delayed to June and then delayed now to July. And I have a feeling that the courts are going to keep delaying and delaying because they don't want to have to deal with the issue. But the reality is that we have to come to terms with what we're doing to our unborn children here. Mm. We cannot continue to take their lives as though they're totally irrelevant. So a lady, she could be just about to give birth here in Israel and she's allowed to kill it? She's, yes, she's allowed to kill it. She has to go to a, what they call a superior committee, and it's almost always for health reasons. Rarely the mothers, although that's what the pro-abortionists say, the mother's health, but that's very rarely true because you would just take the baby out and not kill it. Mm. Hare, at 24 weeks, the baby's a viable person. Mm. And I've actually spoken to doctors about this, and I've said, a pro-life doctor I spoke to, and I said, well, what if the mother has cancer? What are you going to do? And he said, we are going to take the baby out at first opportunity. 24 weeks, as soon as we can save that baby's life and save the mother, we're going to take the baby out. In other words, there is almost no situation where it's life-threatening for the mother. And of course, and I hear on the news all the time now, what if it's ectoptic? That means if the baby is in the fallopian tube. Well, of course the mother would die or the, and the baby would die. That's an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. Of course they're going to. That's not called abortion. That's called treatment. And of course, if the baby's heart is not beating in the womb, of course, it's a miscarriage. We're talking about situations where the mother does not need to take the life of the baby, rather deliver the baby if there's any kind of risk. For example, if you, and I, I say this, and Paul, you and I were just discussing how much we care about the Down syndrome children, how precious they are and how happy they are. But if you were 38 weeks pregnant, just about to deliver, and you found out your baby had Down syndrome, you could abort in Israel. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the person, that child, has no rights until the cord is cut and the head emerges. It's, yeah. yeah. Is there any way that abortion is okay, in your, in your view? No, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we say abortion, what we mean is to stop a pregnancy when the baby is still viable. And I would say no, because it just doesn't make any sense. It's a, for me, the baby, once the baby is conceived, it's a human being with rights like anybody else. And it's not in our hands to take that person's life. And I dearly, I just want to say that we here at, this is Ba'at Chaim, is Israel pro-life. We really care about the mothers. Mm. Absolutely. We support them for a year. Well, we support them for a year after the birth, but we also support them throughout the pregnancy. 
emotionally and with friendship and encouragement. And then after the baby's born, we support that baby for a year. And there would be no reason to take the life of the baby. As a matter of fact, abortion hurts women. Abortion causes depression. A third of the women are going to have some kind of fertility issue. Abortion is not in the best interest of the woman. And this is something that nobody talks about. Women need to be listened to. Women need the right to know the facts and not pressed by a man, by her bank account, by her so-called friends in the army. She doesn't need to be pushed into having an abortion. She needs to be listened to and cared for and supported. So when they say abortion is health care, it's actually worse for the, for the mother. It's not healthy for anybody. Mm. It's gonna, it could cause her depression. It could cause her to start drinking more. It could cause her to try to get pregnant again. They call that replacement pregnancy. It's quite a common phenomenon. It's not healthy for her. It's not healthy for the baby. You know, when you talk about what, it, what would be the reason for an abortion, usually it's because she's ashamed, she's afraid. Her boyfriend or her husband has said, we have to get rid of this baby. We can't afford it. We don't want it. And she's feeling so pressured and so almost guilty. Women in Israel, I know, are made, many of the women who come here are made to feel guilty about keeping a baby. Mm-hmm. Somebody said to me the other day, why would you bring a baby into the world who's not going to have a good life? And I'm like, how do you know who's going to have a good life? Who, what, a, what a comment is that? I mean, my husband, when we married, was a student. And according to the statistics, you know, the legal numbers, we were under the poverty level. But so what? We were not unhappy. We were thrilled. We were a young couple, and he was a student. It wasn't about money. It was about life quality, which was very good. You know, there was nothing. Someone said to me recently, there's a big difference between being unhappy and miserable and not having money. I mean, money comes and goes, honestly. I mean, I think many people know that um, Steve Jobs' mother was a student in college when she got pregnant with him and she was told to abort. And then look at what happened to Steve Jobs. You know, he... The same with Cristiano Ronaldo as well. Yeah, so many, so many, you know. And, um, you know, Tebow, the football player, his mother apparently had some kind of disease when she was pregnant with him and they told her your baby will be handicapped and he became this famous football player. You know, so many times. And you know what? Even, I do have a close friend who had a baby and he was handicapped, but that child turned that mother's life around. He caused that mother to stop drinking. He caused that mother to take responsibility for her life. And she says always, that child is now in his 20s, and she says, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. We cannot judge who's going to be happy and who's going to be unhappy. That's, that's just ridiculous, and we don't know what our life situation is going to be. I might be a single woman now, and in five years, I, I don't know what, you know, I discover the cure to AIDS. I don't know. Mm. We don't know what life is going to bring. When is there a heartbeat? A heartbeat. Uh, the heart starts beating 22 days after conception. It's heard, and we always hear in the news it's only heard at five to six weeks. That's true because that's when the doctor or the ultrasound technician is able to hear it. But indeed, it's beating already at 22 days after conception. And if you look on the internet, and I would suggest to anybody listening, if you don't believe me, just look on the internet. Look baby development and listen to this fact. When a woman is trying to conceive and she becomes pregnant, she always says, I'm pregnant with a baby. I'm so excited. I have a baby. She never says, I'm pregnant with a fetus or an embryo. Come on. Mm -hmm. But if she wants an abortion, she always says fetus or a bunch of cells or embryo. She never says baby. But it's the same, it's the same individual. The, the person inside her womb is the same person. The heart is beating. You know, at, at eight weeks, every organ is there. At 10 weeks, every organ is functioning. At 12 weeks, the blood is flowing and everything is there. At 16 weeks, that baby is the size of my palm with eyelashes and little bits of hair in his head and the beginning of fingernails. We are talking about human beings. Uh, now, you're asking women not to have an abortion. Is there more that the church can do to support ladies caught in this difficult situation? I'm actually not asking don't have an abortion. What I'm asking is let us help you. Mm. Let us support you. And your question is absolutely appropriate because the answer is support those who are in trouble. A lot of people make mistakes, and I think we can think right back to the Bible about King David, that he slept with Bathsheba. He made a mistake. But his next mistake, of course, was killing her husband. And then the baby died, as we all know. Let us support those who are in trouble and not condemn. And I have to say this, you know, there are many young women, or even not so young women, women maybe in the church who were divorced, who have made a mistake, who have slept with somebody out of wedlock, they get pregnant, and they're just so ashamed that people would know. 
Let us not do that. Let us support them and encourage them and say, you know what? You made a mistake, but we're here for you. And I'll share a story with you. One of the women in her 20s in our, in our we say here in Israel congregation, she became pregnant out of wedlock. And I was actually trying to encourage her to walk with the Lord, but she was having a hard time. And when she became pregnant, I told her, listen to me. I, I don't tell people what to do. I just encourage. But in this case, I'm going to tell you that this child is going to save your life. Mm. This baby is going to bring you closer again to the Lord. He's going to help you to figure out why you're here. He's going to bless you. She gave birth to that little fellow. And the day she came back to our congregation with a big belly, I ran around. I'm a pastor's wife, and I ran around to all the women of the congregation whispering, encourage, love, support. And this precious woman, the congregation maybe made her a baby shower. Mm. And she's now a godly, godly mother. I thank God for that. Wow. Yeah. What does the Bible say about the unborn? <laughs> you can go everywhere in the Bible and see it. It's so clear. Psalm 139, I made you in the womb. I formed you. I knew you before you were there. I had your days ordained. Precious in my sight is your life. In Jeremiah, he says, I knew you. I called you to be a prophet in the womb. But really, you can go. I mean, Isaiah and Paul himself says, the Lord called me even before I was born. You can look, but, but the best, the best is really what is so clear is John in his mother's womb in Elisheba, we say, in, in Elizabeth's womb, when Jesus comes in inside Mary's womb. And of course, Jesus is just in his, you know, first trimester there in Mary's womb. She walks into the room and baby John leaps in the womb. Mm. And what does that tell us? That tells us that John and his mother Elizabeth says, my, my baby recognized who came in. Mm. Blessed are you, the mother of the Messiah. But John was already a prophet in the womb. Mm. That baby was a prophet, and Jesus was already Messiah in the womb. Our callings are right there, right there from the moment of conception. So it may be an accident to you and me, but it's not an accident to God. Oh, God has. He says, I have predestined you and known the plans I have for you from the Yisodot, from the foundation of the earth. I have good plans for you. And you know, every baby was so what? We don't know his life situation when he comes into this world. But God, but God can just turn around our lives and turn us into something so amazing. God has good plans. And you know, I've, I've watched handicapped children and some, because their parents are disappointed and hurting, the children are bitter. And some, because the parents raise up that child to be everything they could possibly be, are just delightful, rejoicing human beings. And I, I was saying that I, I have a, a friend who had a handicapped son and that young man now is in his 20s, and he loves the Lord with all his heart. And he has a wonderful kind of offbeat, off-melody voice, and he sings behind me in the congregation. And I just adore listening to him because, you know, I say about this young man whose IQ may not be so high, but I say his EQ. Mm. Rarely do I meet somebody with so much emotional intelligence because he just knows the love. He just knows love. He knows God's love. He knows love. He doesn't have guile in him. Like some of these Down syndrome children, there's just no guile. Mm. There's a goodness and a love of God in these people that is so pure. Mm. What do you do here at Bayat Chaim? So Bayat Chaim, first of all, Bayat Chaim is the, uh, the Amutah, the nonprofit, which runs many pregnancy centers across Israel called Merkaz Lilach or Lilac Centers. They're all over Israel. And our goal is to first protect the mother and then protect the baby. Mm -hmm. And I say that because you can't protect a baby if you're not protecting his mother. Mm -hmm. You can't. You have to care and love for the mother. Practically speaking, we do three major things in our pregnancy centers. We provide hope for the mother in crisis. She finds us either by, we do a lot of PR, a lot. So she either finds us on Google or by bus ads. We now have 330 buses across Israel or we had a radio ad going for the last 10 days, or she might find us on a billboard in Tel Aviv. She might find us on Facebook or Instagram. I mean, we're just everywhere so that women in need will find us. Mm. And the first thing we offer is hope. Sweetheart, you don't have to abort. I know nobody's listening to you. Your boyfriend's ashamed. Your father's ashamed. We are listening to your heart. You want to keep the baby? We're going to help you do that. And so what we offer is also practical help. We have a project called Operation Moses that provides every basic need of the baby for a full year from the time of birth till their first birthday, providing the bed, the stroller, the bathtub, the bed sheets, and every month a gift card worth about, well, more than $100 mm. to buy that baby what he needs. 
whether it be diapers, formula, whatever it is, we provide for the mother what she needs for her baby. Yeah, and then the third thing we offer here is healing. Healing for those who've had a reproductive loss, whether it be abortion, miscarriage, or uh, stillbirth. We have counseling, and we have, and I hope people hear this, we have a garden, which is really a forest in the middle of Israel in the Trun area, where trees are planted in memory of babies who died, who were not able to be held and loved. And people, whether it be siblings or parents or anybody, can plant a tree in memory of that child and find closure from the loss and the grief. Do you work with both Arabs and Jews? Oh, we work with everybody. The rain falls on everybody. So not just Arabs and Jews. We help foreign workers all over the country. In the, in the north, we help a lot of Arabs because they live in the villages. Of course, the majority are Israelis because this is Israel. But, you know, native-born... Well, we help Ukrainian refugees, and we help the Arabs in the villages. And in the south, in the Beersheba, we help lots of Bedouin, meaning the nomadic people. In Jerusalem, we're helping lots of Eritrean and Ethiopian refugees. In Tel Aviv, we're helping a lot of foreign workers down at the, in the poor areas of the central bus station. We help everybody because everybody is created in the image of God. Do you know how many babies you've saved? Oh, hallelujah. Since we started the Operation Moses Project in 2006, we've saved over 4,000 babies. Wow. Right now, because it's exponential, I mean, the first year it was 14, then 40. Right now, we're helping, I can't believe it, 750 women with their babies. Some are pregnant, some are after birth, but 750. So our team is constantly expanding and growing and being very challenged to the hilt. I keep adding more staff, but it's never enough. Yeah. Yeah. Do uh, mothers love to come back here years later with their child and show you what their child is like at this particular point? Sometimes they do, and it's a great, great joy. One time, um, a woman phoned me. She said she'd seen one of our staff on TV talking about our work, and she said, my daughter, who's seven, saw her photograph in your office and said, Mommy, why, are my, why is my baby picture in their office? And the mother wisely said to her, when I was pregnant, I was alone and I was in big trouble, and those people held me with you. They provided everything I needed. And that little girl was in first grade when she phoned. Wow. I just am thrilled to know that we have saved all those lives. So anybody listening, can they sponsor a mother to help that mother keep her child, keep her baby? Yeah, you're most welcome to look us up on the internet. It looks like Bead Chaim, B-E-A-D-C-H-A-I-M, Be'ad Chaim. Look us up on the internet. You're welcome to sponsor a mother. You're welcome to donate any amount. You're also welcome to help the girl in your neighborhood not to have an abortion. You're welcome to encourage her. You're welcome to help the new single mom in your neighborhood. You're welcome to help the couple who's struggling with their marriage and they just had a baby and they're falling apart. Help them in your churches. Welcome them. Encourage them. Make them baby showers. Give them baby supplies. And also, I just want to say, if you have lost a baby, God is the God of love and forgiveness and healing. And we also plant trees for people that are abroad. If you'd like us to plant a tree in the gardens of life for you, we'll send you a beautiful certificate. It's really lovely, and um, it's a painting by the, the Galilean artist Amy Sheathreet, and you can put the baby's name there on that certificate, and we'll tell you that we planted the tree, send you photographs of the tree being planted, and our prayer hostess will pray for you for healing. So you are most welcome to find healing through our ministry. I just want to say that we care about people. This is a ministry which is compelled by the love of God. And when people tell me you are against women, I, it deeply grieves me because I love women. Mm. And when people tell me you're against abortion, I don't like to say I'm against. I like to say I'm pro-God, pro-life, because we care about the lives of the mother, the child, and her family. We care about people. Mm. That's what God says, his heartbeat. You know, the heartbeat of God is like this, people, 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 people. And that what our, that's what our heartbeat needs to be. Why do you do what you do? I do it because of the love of God. I don't have a choice. I um, when they offered me this job in 2005, I said no. And then I um, I came for a meeting anyway with the chairman of the board, and he, he said, why don't you want to do anything about abortion? I said, it's so unpopular. People will be angry with me, which they are. You know, it's hard to talk to people about abortion. And he said, you love Israel? I said, I love Israel. He said, you need to stop the shedding of innocent blood on the land. And he gave me a bunch of books and films, and he said, study, come back in a month. And during that month, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, Proverbs 24, 11 and 12, rescue those being led to slaughter. Do not say you do not know, for the Lord will consider your heart and he will render to each one according to what he has done. 
And the Lord said, you don't have a choice. And he showed me myself like an ostrich. And he said, you can do something or stick your head in the sand. What's it going to be? And like, remember, Mordecai said to Queen Esther when she said, I could perish if I go to the king to save the people. I could perish. And he said, you know what, Esther, God is going to save the Jewish people either way. If you want to take a part, go ahead. And the Lord said to me, do you want to take a part? And I can say, Paul, it's been not an easy journey, mm. but highly rewarding and a privilege to see the lives that we've saved, the lives we've rescued, and the mothers who are so deeply grateful, who had weighed abortion and then realized that they could get help and support and chose life. What's your website again for people who'd like to know more? It's beadchaim.com, B-E-A-D-C-H-A-I-M.com. Okay, Sandy, thank you very much. God bless, and I hope that each one of you is deeply encouraged today.